I have with me now Javon J.T. McCormick. He's the president and CEO of Scribe Media. Javon, welcome. Kylie, how are you, sir? <laughs> I'm good. It's good to see you. How's life in Austin? You as well. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's excellent. We got through the uh, our, our single digit temperature drop and the, the freeze and the uh, you know the the electricity uh, going away, but we're we're good now. We're we're excellent. Yeah, so it's back to 100 degrees then. <laughs> back to 100 degrees. That, that's the beauty of, of of Texas. You know, one <laughs> week it was it was nine degrees. The following it was 72. So here we are. Yeah, I, I spent a little time in that city, so I I understand the uh, the the challenges sometimes, but it's definitely uh, definitely worth it. So. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to say, first off, congratulations. I know that Scribe has had an incredible year. Um, I know from personal experience that the pandemic has been very, very good for book sales. So um, I think it's a real testament to you and the leadership and the team at Scribe for posting such record numbers. What's it been like for you leading this team through such a deeply weird time? You know, it, it it was challenging early on, and and I'll say this for, for, in my opinion for leadership. You know, you're you're only as good as a leader as the great people you're surrounded by, and we're surrounded by a great what we call ourselves a tribe. So we we pivoted quickly. You know, March was a big hit for us, uh, revenue wise as it was for for so many. But then we came back in in April and had a record month, and had another record month in May, June, July. And so overall, we pivoted nicely. Most of that was set up because of the way we already operated as a company. You know, we we have always had a dynamic culture where there's no, okay, be at the office at 8 a.m., leave at 5 p.m. People come into the office two to three times a week. You can come in at 10 a.m. You can leave at 7 p.m. There's, there's no micromanagement. You know, we, we hire adults and we set the expectation. We want you to drive results in your role. We want you to perform in your role. And we want you to live by the principles and values of the company. If you're doing those three things, hey, we, we don't really check on you if at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday you're down on Town Lake paddleboarding. Good, good for you. I love that. That um, I do. Th I do think that there's a lot to be said for 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 companies like yours that were sort of ahead of the game on that. Um, earlier, Alain Silvans talked about uh, Patagonia as one of those companies, and I feel like those companies definitely were a little prescient. So, in terms of your culture, can you tell me a little bit more about the culture at Scribe? Like, what are the values when you say that you you know as long as you, the adults that work at your company that live by the values. What are those values? Can you outline those for us? Yeah, so we, we've we've got a pretty big list of uh, values and principles, but I'll, I'll start with what it's all predicated on. So our number one value is people. Our number two principle is do right by people. My opinion, if you always put people first, you, you will always succeed. So people, process, profits. And as an added bonus, if you're profitable, you can do great things for the communities that, that you serve in. But profit is not a bad word. And we want to make sure that above profit, we put people first. So if we always do right by people, we can build great process. We can make great profits. And as I said, we can do great things for the communities in which we serve. But it, it all starts with, with people. And, and this, is, this is key, Kylie. Um, it, it starts with the whole self, all of the person, not just your, your work self, not just when you're at, at home. If you have challenges outside of the office and we can assist somehow, we want to do that. We've had people who have been heavily in debt. So we've had roundtables of how can you get out of debt? We've had people who've had family issues. How can we assist with that? With a group that's almost 100 people, I would like to believe someone within our tribe has had some type of encounter with so many life issues that go on that we should be able to rally around those individuals and help them with life issues as well. It's not work or life. It's just life. We all have to work. We all have bills. So we focus on life, not work-life balance. We, there, we, have, we do not use that phrase here at the office. 
that makes I, I I really really appreciate that. And speaking of life, um, I know that you've written and spoken a lot about your life and your upbringing, and sort of the path that you took to to get to where you are. How has how has your 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 um, your past and what you've learned along the way informed you during this past year when things have been really really difficult, not only with the pandemic but the social unrest and and sort of everything that was going on. How have you leaned on on your past to get you through? Oh, Kylie, you you know that's a you you opened up a question right there. <laughs> so so let let's put a little context behind that. So I, as you know, my my dad was a pimp and drug dealer back in the seventies. He he fathered twenty three children. I'm I'm one of twenty three. Uh, I, my mother was a, a single mom. I'm the only one by my mother. She was an orphan. She was raised in a 1950s institutional orphanage. Uh, when she graduated high school in the orphanage, they gave her $20, a small suitcase, and said, good luck to you. There's the world. Unfortunately for my mother, one of the first people she met was my quite a bit older, fast-talking father. And that is what I came into the world. You know, my, my dad's black, my mom's white, so I'm mixed race. And, and I say this to people, especially now, uh, you, you want to have a race discussion? Let me let me explain to you what it's like when black people don't like you because you're half white and white people don't like you because you're half black. And, and you have an identity problem at times. You, you were never white enough. You were never black enough. So, you know, that's what I came into the world, man. I, gosh, I, I've watched my dad collect money from prostitutes. And I can tell you hands down, that's where I learned empathy. When I saw how the prostitutes were treated, I remember as a nine-year-old kid saying to myself, wow, I wonder if I had the prostitutes keep part of the money. And if I treated them better, could I make more money in volume uh, just just based on the fact that I treat everyone nicer? And, and I know uh, for a lot of people, they're going to like, oh, my God, what kind of lesson is that? Well, it's the lesson of where I grew up. It's, it's where my lessons came from. But it was my first introduction to empathy. How, how do we do this better? How do we put people first? And so I, that, that was my takeaway. How do I scale this? How do I, I treat the, the ladies better, if you will? So my lessons came from some very odd places in life, but when it comes to treating people and empathy, that that lesson has stayed with me my my entire career. That you can't go wrong if you put people first, and that and that's just the way we do business here at Scribe. Like I said, the number one value: people. Yeah, that that's a. I mean, it's just a remarkable story. And uh, for for those in the audience who haven't seen uh, Javon speak, please go find those videos. He's he's a remarkable presenter. Um, speaking of empathy, it's been sort of the word of the day, right? We have heard from many people from many sort of different roles talk about the importance of empathy. You're a deeply empathetic person. How has this conversation about empathy struck you? As someone who just assumes empathy as sort of table stakes, how has this conversation about leading with empathy and empathy as, as sort of something you should start doing, how, did, how has that struck you um, from what you've heard over the last you know, few months? You, you know, I, I say this without being uh, arrogant or, or, or cocky. Uh, for, for me, it's a bit of a, a, about time. You know, you, you, we should have always been putting people first. And, and again, uh, for me, I've known since my childhood what it was like to not be accepted because, again, being half white, half black, you know, so I've always been empathetic for uh, gays. I've always been empathetic for people who don't fit what society's mold is because I know all too well what that looks like. To, to not be accepted. So I, I have long felt that, you know, we, we'd be a better society if we just come to accept. You don't, you don't even have to respect. If you just accept that we all have different beliefs, we all have different family values, we all have different religious beliefs. But the fact of the matter is, 
we can all coexist. And, and for me, again, I know all too well what it's like to eat out of a trash can, uh, be raised by a single mom. I, I have no college degree. I have a GED. So I've lived in a world of constantly being judged by my background. So empathy for me, I, I'm looking at society saying to myself right now, it, it's about time you caught up. I, I totally agree. I mean, I do. Part of me thinks that, yes, this is great that corporate America is learning the word. Right. And that it's that's now part of the conversation. Um, and I feel like as much as the pandemic has taught us, I feel like the events of the last 12 months, uh, including the social unrest, the George Floyd murder, those events have have also, you know, deep deepened that sort of respect. Um, and that for the for the word empathy, how have the how have the events of the past year outside the pandemic, but the other events, the social events, how have how have those sort of affected, you know, the job that you're doing or the work that you're doing at, at Scribe, the team there, the tribe, as it were? Um, how have you guys dealt with with those uh, sort of social issues as well as the pandemic issues? You know, I, obviously, for for us, as with all companies, the social unrest that happened after the the George Floyd murder was was huge and i remember we had an all hands and everyone wanted to know okay well you know javon what what's your your thought on this and i i was i was open i was direct and i was honest and and i said i'm i'm frustrated i i'm frustrated by the fact that this isn't new i i'm frustrated by the fact that if you say to me right now wow, did you see what happened to, to the guy who died saying, I can't breathe? I'm frustrated by the fact that I got to ask you which guy. You know, it, it, you can't just be talking about George Floyd because he's not the only one that, that did that. So I was frustrated by it. And I, and I let people know, look, I've been going through this since I was a kid. This isn't new. I knew what it was like to be evicted uh, with my mother and put on the streets because she had a mixed race son and, and they didn't want the quote unquote special N word lovers living in, in the, the public housing. So th this isn't new. And and really what, what it came, what came to a head for me is back in my early twenties, I remember trying to get on people's calendar to get get a job to to get you know uh, make a sales call and I could not get on someone's calendar to save my life. One gentleman was kind enough to get on the call and he said, "Hey, I got a question for you." And cuz my, my name's Javon McCormick. He said, "How did you get a black first name and an Irish last name?" So here's what's funny. My last name, I never knew it was Irish. My mother got that last name in the in the orphanage, and we have no clue where it comes from, no clue why why we have it, but it's my last name. So I was excited to find out that my last name was Irish. But when I hung up from the call, I realized, oh, Javon, that's why I'm not getting on people's calendars. You're seeing the the black name. So I made the decision. My full name is Javon Thomas McCormick. I made the decision back in my early 20s, I'm 49 now, so this is a long time ago, I made the decision to start going by JT. I'll be damned if the next week I didn't start getting on people's calendars, just lit up with, with appointments. So from the time, my early 20s to last year, call it May, June, when, when the George Floyd murder happened, I went by JT. When I watched the George Floyd situation happen, the murder happen, what really disturbed me and, and quite frankly frustrated me, um, the shallow stagnant status signaling things that I saw happening, Blackout Tuesday on Twitter, people, oh, I, we support too, we, we blacked out our, our Twitter, our social media, and I, and I thought to myself, what does that actually do to help change the situation, to help move the needle? Okay, great, you blacked out Tuesday or on social media. And then we were arguing over a syrup bottle. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what does this do to help with the situation? But then I read an article, and this is what jumped out to me. I saw an article that said that there were only three Fortune 500 CEOs in America. And I said, interesting, for, uh, black Fortune 500 CEOs. So I went and looked at their names and I saw their names, Kenneth Frazier, Marvin Ellison, and Roger Ferguson. 
And I, and I love all three of these guys because they made it to the top of, uh, of the game, worked hard. They, they deserved everything they, they received. However, I noticed there were three very ethnic free names, if you will. And then I noticed that the richest black man in America is named Robert Smith. And so I said to myself, OK, wait a minute. There's no Javon on that list. And I said to myself, OK, I've made it to the CEO chair. I'm going to reclaim my name from JT to Javon. And I'm not doing it for myself. I did it because I want every kid that comes from the situation I come from, those lower economic communities I come from, every kid named Revante, Martavius, Laquanda, Lucretia, to one day, one day, maybe you'll be able to go into the workplace and work next to a Javon and not just a JT. And that's why I changed it back to Javon, because there was a belief that one day you won't be judged by your name. You'll just be judged by, am I, do I have a great character and do I have a hell of a work ethic? I absolutely. I think that's a, a you know, a, a really remarkable stand to take and and a very personal one and taking a very personal stand on a very public level. How how was that message received by the tribe at Scribe? I think what's really fascinating about about uh, about Scribe and you, Javon, is the fact that it's it's not a big company, but it's doing big things, right? It's amplifying a lot of voices. Uh, you guys have a lot of really really well received books. I think there's something about what you're doing at Scribe that are lessons much larger companies could take away, especially when it comes to issues like this one. Um, how, how was the message? Did you have a message for the team at Scribe? Like I'm doing this and this is the reason I'm doing it. Or was it something that they just noticed and then you addressed it? How did that unfold for you, uh, with the, with the Scribe team? You know, it, it unfolded during that all hands is when I actually made the decision to, to reclaim my name back to Javon and it was well received. I, I in, in fact, it's probably been two years in the making. I've had so many of the tribe members say, hey, you should start going by Javon again. And and I never did. And just that that whole moment of where we transitioned as a society really, I guess, in my opinion, gave me the opening to, to make that change and, and reclaim my name. It was completely well received. Uh, most people said it was long overdue. I agree. Uh, hell, my my mom was even happy. She was. She's been trying to get me to go by Javon for years. Uh, and I always make the joke too. I have a black name, but it was my white mom that named me. So uh, it, it was very well received. And, and you're right. W within our tribe, that's how we we live. There's we don't pass judgment here. You know, it doesn't matter what your political view is. It's do right by people. That's it. And, and it's, I won't make this a religious aspect, but I find it interesting that in the Bible it says, um, love thy neighbor. And it says, this is the most important commandment. Now, what's interesting is it didn't say love thy neighbor, but not if they're mixed race, love thy neighbor, but not if they're gay. It just said love thy neighbor. And so the way we live as a tribe is love thy neighbor. And it's such a simple concept. We can all have differences of opinions, different religious beliefs, different uh, whatever your sexual orientation is. But at the end of the day, put people first. That That's the whole driver behind this. Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic message, too. And, and one that we've heard a lot today is the, the centering people in sort of everything you do, like employees, your customers, looking them as people, right? I think is the is the one of the most important takeaways um, from from the past year. So speaking of takeaways, if you had one piece of advice to 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 give any of our you know leaders, executive leaders, business leaders in the audience today, as they face a very uncertain certain future, what 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 one piece of advice would you give them? Uh, get get away from this topic. This this what I call a a, a BS phrase of work life balance. It, it's just life. 
You know, people have children, people have things that go on outside. And, and here's what's interesting to me as a society. If you say work-life balance and you ask people, what does that mean to you? If you can ask leaders, you can ask uh, individuals, people who aren't in leadership. But if you ask, what does work-life balance mean to you? The first thing you're going to hear is they're going to attack work. Don't work 60, 70 hours a week. Don't check your emails first thing in the morning. We should have a four-day work week. Everyone attacks work, work, work. But no one actually looks at the life side of this. No one says, right. mm, maybe I shouldn't binge watch Friday through Sunday uh, and then wake up Monday morning upset that I haven't achieved my dreams and goals. Maybe I shouldn't go to the bar Thursday through Sunday and then be pissed off on Monday because I haven't achieved my <laughs> dreams and goals. So I, I would get away from the whole work-life balance. There's life. And, and life really got stuck in our face during the virus disruption. Yeah, we had to have Zoom calls where people had their children sitting in their lap on the call. But you know what? We still made it through. The world kept turning. We're all still here. So it, it's life. How can we support one another in life? 